Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. If this is your first time here and you enjoy horror stories, consider joining us and clicking subscribe down below. Also, please like this video to show your support for the channel. Thank you. I am your host. Let's begin. My parents were planning their first vacation in years. That's what they kept saying. They only wanted one night away from our shenanigans. My dad was bent on making me deal with my younger siblings. So I convinced my dad that I would be in charge of the house when they were gone. I was 15, so it was. It wasn't bad being the man in the house, but mum thought otherwise. Mum wanted dad to hire a babysitter for us. No kid my age wanted someone to look after them. I wanted the house to myself, and no babysitter would take that from me. On Thursday, when I returned home from school, I waited until mum was home. Once everyone was settled, I met her while she made plans for the next day. Hey mum, how you doing? I asked as I sat beside her. She gave me a stern look, but I kept smiling at her. I'm alright, how was your day at school? She kept me as she kept arranging her calendar. I'm fine, it was alright. Sam, out with it. I know you didn't come here to check up on me, mum said as she rolled her eyes. What? You know I always check up on you, I do that every day, I said sarcastically. Name one time you did, and there was nothing you needed from me. Well, I can't remember everything you know, I said with a smile. Alright, fine, just because you insisted. Mum opened her mouth in shock. I know you guys are planning to spend the night of your anniversary on yourselves. And yes, I agree, but I don't understand why you think that we need a babysitter. Mum, I'm 15, Haley is 13, also Jake is 10, none of us need a babysitter. You see this attitude? That's why I got you. Babysitter, I don't know the crazy things you're up to while we're gone, Mum said as she dropped the calendar and walked to the kitchen. Mum, I don't recall any crazy things I've done, I said out loud. Let's see and you gave your brother a wedgie. <laughs> that was hilarious. She glared at me. Sorry? You started your father's car and almost killed our neighbor's dog. How about that time? Mum pointed towards the garage. The dog was in the way, I defended myself. You almost blew up the place with your crazy science experiment. Mum was still mad about that. But I didn't. You destroyed the entire circuit in the house. How is that good? Mum asked. For my experiment? You know what? This conversation is over, and I'm getting Becky to stay with you guys till we get back. Before I could say anything else, Mum walked straight to her bedroom. We were not allowed there, so I returned to my bedroom, where my siblings waited for the news. So? Is mum still getting us a babysitter? Haley asked as I walked in. <sighs> I guess so, I replied and laid on my bed. I'm sure we all know whose fault it is, right? Haley asked while she stared at me. You can just say it without acting up, you know. Sam, your room is cool, Jake called out while he played around with my action figures. I stared at the ceiling wondering how to get out of this situation. I thought of trying to convince Dad, but I knew it was pointless. When my mum had already spoken, Dad followed, so I decided to resign to our fate as accepting a babysitter for the evening. I spent the next week coming up with plans that Jake would be interested in. Haley said that she didn't want anything to do with us, which was weird, we always knew she would end up doing them with us either way, 
She didn't like the work that came with everything or the clearing up. The weekend was getting closer by the minute, and I'd been preparing my ideas since I learned that Mum was bringing Becky home with her instead. It's Friday afternoon, and I'm waiting at school for Mum to come pick me up. It was hammering it down outside. Every time it rained heavily, we had a schedule that Mum would come pick me up. So I knew that if it was raining hard, just to wait at school until she turned up. The last bell rang and she pulled up outside. Sam, you ready? She called out as I didn't notice her. I nodded in reply and ran over. Where's Becky? I asked as I hopped in the car. You already know her. There isn't a need for you to meet her again, is there? Mum asked. Are you planning on making her scared or something? Mum, you know what I can do? And that isn't something I will do. I sighed as we drove out of the parking lot. I'm not sure when it comes to you, but don't you even dare to try anything stupid with her. She's innocent, and besides, we're paying her to do a job, so you better behave. Well, nothing I'm going to say here would change your mind, so I won't even bother trying, I replied as she drove us home in the rain. We got home. Dad was already home from work early. He was with Jake and Haley. They already made plans, but Dad wasn't looking too happy. What's the problem? Mum asked the moment she saw him after stepping through the front door. Dad sighed. Becky won't be able to make it. She said that she had to be somewhere, and that was that. What? What do we do now? Mum asked. She turned to me, who was smiling, but I was trying to hide it. We can't leave the kids without anyone, all here on their own overnight. I can call Carol and ask her about her babysitter. They've been working together for a long while. Dad said this as Mum walked into the living room, looking like she was on the point of tears. Do, do you think that would work? Mum asked. It has to. We can't keep cancelling each time. You always get worked up when things don't work your way. Mum wanted to protest, but Dad held her and kissed her, trying to reassure her that we'd somehow find a way out of this. We being not me, just them. Damn, I felt a sense of adrenaline come over me, thinking that it was now a possibility that we would actually be home alone. Gross, Jake said as he walked away. I guess mum and dad hugging and kissing made him feel a bit funny. I laughed behind him. It wasn't Becky tonight. I don't know who it was as far as I wouldn't be bothered. Later that night, it was time for mum and dad to leave, and someone was at the door. I went to answer it and there was a girl who looked like she was around 19 years old. She had black hair and a wonderful smile, very attractive. I forgot what I was there to do and just kept staring at her. Hi, I'm Carla, the babysitter. Her voice was soft and lovely. Hey, I'm... Mum cut me off. Carla, thank God you're here. We have to leave now. Dinner is in the fridge and the kids should be in bed by 9pm please. Is that okay? Thank you. But except for Sam, he may be stubborn, but he can handle himself. Mum said as she picked up her bag and Dad followed suit after he gave a salute. Well, I'm Sam. I began pointing at myself awkwardly while blushing. That's Haley, and that's Jake, I said, walking back to my room. I had not learned what they were discussing since I lost interest when I entered my room. I played on my PC all night and realised it was time to check up on Jake and Haley. I left my bedroom, Jake was asleep on his bed, and Haley was getting ready. I walked to the living room to find Carla, but she wasn't there. It wasn't odd. Most time, Becky stayed in the kitchen when she babysat us, but Carla wasn't also in the kitchen either. I heard the front door open, 
and I walked towards it. Carla tried her best to be silent and jumped when she turned to see me, probably expecting me to still be in my room or asleep like my brothers and sisters. What the hell? You scared me, Carla said while she hid something behind her back. What is that? And why is there something on your face? I asked. I walked into the living room and turned on the light. I noticed the blood on the side of her face and a few splotches on her shirt. Uh, well, uh, I, uh, uh, Carla stuttered as she tried to speak coherently. Is that blood? I asked. Fuck, not you too, Carla muttered to herself. What? What do you mean by that? Carla chased after me. I ran from her without much thought. At first I thought this was some kind of a game. I was glad I locked Jake's door and Haley was busy with her hair to know what was going on. Sam, come back here, Carla called out with a soothing voice. I don't know why, but everything within me warned me to run as fast as possible. I used the back door to the garage and hid there. Carla walked in after a while. I know you're here and I will find you. Then she startled me as her face appeared before me. Her once beautiful smile had a fear inducing look. Sam, it's rude to run away from your babysitter. She grabbed me by the shirt and threw me across the garage. I landed on the side. It felt like I'd cracked my ribs. I screamed out. It was so loud I hoped someone heard me. What do you want? I didn't do anything wrong. Why are you doing this? I remember screaming out. Then, why did you run from me? Carla asked with an eerie smile on her face. I got up as she approached me with something hidden behind her. I knew everything was wrong with her. I wanted to run away, but there was nowhere to run in the garage. With each step she took, I could feel the goosebumps on my skin. Then, I noticed a figure behind her. It was Trevor, our neighbour, who I hit his dog that time. Trevor tackled Carla to the ground, and I saw the knife stained with blood clattered on the floor. Get out of here, he yelled at me. I ran to the living room and dialed 911. In less than two minutes, which felt like an eternity to me, a few police officers stormed the place and arrested Carla. Trevor was detained and questioned. He was apprehended, but also rewarded for what he did. He suffered a few cuts on his shoulder and back. It turned out, this girl was insane, had mental issues, and had been going through a breakup with her ex who ditched her. This caused her to just go on a rampage, where she was trying to kill people. It turns out she never killed anyone, but she did kill the neighbor's cat, who just so happened to belong to Trevor. This is how he knew, and heard me yelling, once he came out to his front yard and found his cat dead, decapitated and sliced up on the front lawn. My parents had been looking to move from the state of Georgia for some years now, but there always seemed to be a problem that stopped them. First, it was my dad's mother. She was diagnosed with breast cancer, and as she already lived in Georgia, dad said he needed to be close to her to help out while she went through the tough treatment plans. It took over 12 months to complete, and she did well, but still had to go back every three months for checks after that. Dad was more relaxed after this happened, and was prepared to start looking at moving to Florida. One Saturday morning, Mum got a call at home from the police 
to say could she please come down to the local hospital, as her father had been knocked out by being pushed off his push bike by a drunk driver. Apparently he was in a bad way. When she got to the hospital, the senior doctor told her that her dad had multiple breaks, a fractured skull, internal bleeding, which they were trying to find, and a collapsed lung. He ended up staying in hospital for four weeks, and then having to have some care assistance for another three months, including physiotherapy, along with mental health counselling, because he started suffering from daily bouts of anxiety when he got home. This took over a year before he was physically and mentally well enough for my mum to say, okay, let's start looking again to move to Florida. So I guess you get the idea of the bad luck my family have been through. Mum and dad eventually started by looking online for suitable properties down in Florida. Dad as usual started by setting the bar high for what he thought we needed, like large outdoor pool, hot tub, double garage, gym slash workout rooms, and a minimum of four to five bedrooms and three bathrooms. Then to finish it off, he wanted around an acre of land for the yard, saying that that would be ideal and nice. Mum, on the other hand, was a bit more relaxed about having to get everything on Dad's list. As she said, we'll have to make compromises. If it's the right property in the right place, it does not have to have all the bells and whistles before it can be considered for purchase. The searching for a suitable property seemed to take forever. First Mum, Dad and I all went to Florida for a two-week vacation. We stayed in a hotel and used that as the base to go and explore different areas in Florida to see which areas we thought might be nice to buy a property in. In amongst the viewing, we were throwing in some beach time and boating, and also some sightseeing as well. We all visited some properties while we were down there, but on inspection they did not come up to dad's high bar level, so they were discounted. Personally, I thought the fourth property was a nice one, but Dad said the yard was too small and that the neighbours were too close either side as he liked his privacy. When we got back, I asked a question of my parents. What were they doing about their jobs when we moved eventually? Mum, who was an architect and worked for a well-known company, told me that she already asked her director and he told her that they had a busy office down in Florida. They had spoken to them and they would be happy to offer mum a similar role and comparable salary as well, so this meant that mum was sorted. Dad on the other hand was a lawyer and worked for a middle sized law firm, but they did not have any branches down in Florida as of yet, but they were hoping to soon. However, one of his fellow lawyers had contacts with the large law firm down in Florida. He gave Dad the contact name and number of this firm. Dad had already contacted the firm, and unknown to Mum and me, when we were down in Florida, he said that he had to pop out for an hour to see a friend. He had actually gone to the law firm for an interview, and they had told him that they were happy to offer him a position. So that was much of a surprise to mum and I. My situation was a bit easier. As I worked for a global company online, I was doing web design and building company business plans. I operated from home on my laptop, and if I did ever have to go into the office once or twice a month, my company had two offices in Georgia, but more importantly three offices in Florida, so I was already sorted. Eventually, after four months of looking and four long weekends of going down to view Florida properties, we finally came across a lovely house that was at the very top end of Dad's budget, but had everything Dad had wanted, except that he wanted an acre and this property was slightly under. So Mum had stepped in and said this is the one we're not looking any longer, and Dad agreed. By the time we had sold our house and bought the new one, we moved in and a further four months had passed. 
It took us a bit of time to get the house into order, because as always, until you move, you don't just realise how much junk you own. You also find stuff you thought you had lost as well, and you just have to sort through it all and make a new start. We had been settled in the house for about two months, when mum and dad said to me that they were going to the Key Largo for a week stay, and to see the sights. Dad said, Emma, you're welcome to come if you want, but I declined, as I knew mum and dad needed some downtime and privacy after all the activities were the move. I said that I'd be fine, and mum went out shopping and got the house stocked up for me while they were gone. I saw them off on the Saturday morning and waved as they drove down our long driveway. Then they turned out between the palm trees, and I was home alone. I stepped back in the house and closed the door, and listened for a moment. It was all quiet. Great, I thought, I have the whole house to myself for the week, and the first thing on the agenda this morning is a swim in our new pool. So I went and got my costume on, and walked out onto the patio area. It was lovely bright sunshine and blue sky as I walked off the patio and onto the grass. It was great to feel the grass between my toes as I walked towards the pool. I stopped at the pool edge and looked down into the crystal clear water. The previous owners had cleaned it and refurbished the whole thing before sale of the property. I put my towel down onto the set of pool chairs and walked towards the steps and slowly descended down into the water. At first the water was so cold it almost took my breath completely away, until I pushed off and started to swim towards the far end. Along the way I came across a small frog that had obviously fallen in and was trying to get out. It was so cute. I cupped him in my hand and put him up on the side. Then, he promptly hopped off towards the bushes. I swam back and forth for about 40 minutes, and then decided to get out and sunbathe by the pool. I put my towel out onto the sun lounger and lay back with my eyes closed letting the sun dry me. Suddenly, I heard a sound of a creaking door. In my mind it seemed to be coming from the direction of our patio doors. Instantly I opened my eyes and looked across. Yes, the right patio door was slightly open, and I did know that that was it that creaked slightly. Now I could not remember if I had shut it properly or not, but perhaps in my mind it could have been the wind. Anyway, I decided to get up and go and close it. As I walked over to the door, I thought I saw the briefest of movements in the living room through the wraparound window facing the patio. I stopped and just stared in. There was nothing that I could see the harder I concentrated. I shrugged it off and decided to go in and make a coffee and bring it out to the poolside. I walked in through the porch door and closed it behind me. It was amazing how quiet triple glazing windows made the house. Our old house just had the stand all double glazed, and you could still hear traffic noise, but not with these, it was eerily silent, especially now I was the only one in the house. I went over to the fridge to get the milk for the coffee, and then I suddenly noticed there were two dirty footprints. I froze and quickly tried to make a logical reason in my head for what I was seeing. Well, they were too large for my feet. These were large shoes. I followed the path with my eyes, still not moving, frozen to the spot. The marks were any bit fainter as they moved away, but still visible on the tiled floor. They headed towards the kitchen sideboard and then they turned and headed towards the living room. That was it. I decided I was going to phone 911. I'd never been so scared or panicky in my life. I reached out for my phone, then suddenly came back to reality that I was still wearing my swimsuit. Then I remembered 
I had left it on the kitchen sideboard, and then I froze as I looked across the sideboard and there was no phone there. Then I looked down, and to my horror, I could see Mum's chine rose vase was smashed on the floor. How did I not hear this? My brain was scrambled, trying to make a decision in the stress-filled situation. I know I thought I should run upstairs, so I did. I locked myself in my room and used one of Dad's spare phones. He had told us if any of our had ever failed, we could use it, and pass was on the back the passcode to the phone. Then I dialed 911, but then I thought, I'm trapped in the house until the police turn up. That's not an option. I've got to get out. Why am I standing here frozen to the spot? And now, more to the point, why was the kitchen filling up with water downstairs? I frantically looked around, trying to make sense of what the hell was going on while panicking. I was now coughing uncontrollably. Then, I felt strong hands grabbing me. I screamed. An intruder had crept up on me from behind. I tried to struggle, but I must have passed out or been knocked out. The next thing I remember was waking up in hospital with my parents by my bedside. They looked worried but relieved at the same time. Mum? Dad? What happened? Emma darling, you had a very lucky escape. You must have gone for a swim in the pool, and from what the doctors have said, you had a mini stroke. Lucky for you, the poor man Raman popped around to clean out the pool filter, and we had forgotten to tell you he was coming. Well anyway, he found you semi-conscious floating in the pool, and thank God he pulled you out and called an ambulance. He said you were calling out about an intruder, but not making any sense before you blacked out. My parents brought Raman into the hospital, and I thanked him for saving my life. But to this day I still can't get over how real the whole thing seemed to me. I could have sworn I remember getting out of the pool. All the sensations felt so real. I understand that there is another option, but I feel guilty and bad for even considering it. At this point I've known Rabin, the pool cleaner, for two years. Not once has he ever given me any creepy vibes, or even spoke to me for that matter. So, I don't know what to believe, but I didn't really need any training back after the stroke. A lot of people actually end up needing rehabilitation, but I didn't, apparently mine was only smaller, but the whole situation just has me confused, and even now, it feels like life is just one big daydream, one big daze, where every now and then I get surges of anxiety that make me fear for my life. Ellie was the kind of girl who was so social that it would be like torture for her to be alone. She was so paranoid of always being left alone, even for just a minute, it was like it was her biggest fear and anxiety. Ellie had long blonde hair, she was around my height 5 foot 3. Meet Ellie, my roommate. We used to live in a flat together but now we have a house share between just me and her. Somehow, we managed to find an affordable house. We share and both split 50-50 the rent to the landlord. Most evenings she would be away, usually because she was spending time at her mum's, who only lived three roads down. Her mum had fallen pretty ill recently, as she was struggling with some issues that I wasn't really up to date with. After all, it was none of my business, but I could tell Ellie was getting down, 
and I got the hints and vibes that her mum was coming to the end of her life, and Ellie was doing the majority of the caring. One night, Ellie came to me as I sat on the couch watching TV. She told me that she'd been invited to a party by friends at college. Harrison and Joe had invited her to a nightclub, and then to come back to theirs. Ellie asked me if I wanted to go, but I barely knew Harrison, and had only spoken to Joe about twice of my whole college time. I'd been at college for around three years at this point, so talking to someone once for about not even a minute in three years, I wouldn't say that makes them your friend. But bringing you back to the introduction, Ellie hated being alone. I think she'd rather spend the day in a room full of people who didn't even speak her language than actually alone in her own house. I on the other hand, I was fine with being left home alone. There was no big deal, so after I told her and politely declined, she let Harrison know that it would only be her going and not me. Harrison was going to come by and pick her up at the end of the drive and take her to the club. The goal was that she'd be back around 3am. In my mind, I'd never been left home alone that late at night, and I was starting to consider what I would do when I went to sleep. We only had two house keys. If she lost hers, we were fucked. Ellie is clumsy, 100% clumsy, and I don't think she'll mind me calling her that, because we joke about it most days. But, in my mind, I was thinking of all the worst case scenarios, not because of being home alone was scary, but because of Ellie being out there with the guys and people she didn't really know. Combine that with the fact that I would have to leave the door open, thinking that perhaps she would lose her key, scared me a bit. It was a Thursday, and she was due to go to the party and be picked up by Harrison on Friday. So I had 24 hours to try and run some type of a plan past her. We started with the idea of leaving her key under the doormat. Therefore, if she lost hers, it would be impossible, because it wouldn't be on her. In other words, when she left, she'd just prop it under the mat by the porch, and then go off, enjoy herself, and come back. But we soon realised that there's a 100% probability she would be coming back completely drunk, and would most likely forget where it is under the doormat. As a result, she would just ring the doorbell or bang on the door and wake me up. That was inevitable. We were trying to think of ways that I could sleep in peace and not have to stay up till 3am, considering I had training in the morning. I was a swimmer and competing for regionals at the time, so I didn't have time to be up till 3am, getting only a few hours sleep until training in the morning. When you're a serious athlete, sleep and eating is everything. You might as well not even train if you can't recover properly. That's the whole point. Your body adapts to the stress. But at this point, my body was struggling to adapt to the stress that Ellie was causing it. Eventually, after basically just joking around and laughing about how clumsy she is, especially when she's drunk, we agreed that she would take the key anyway. Screw it, we thought. What other plans can we think of that would work without waking me? Zero. Either Ellie loses the key, or she doesn't. Either I stay asleep, or Ellie wakes me up. Simple. It was either black or white. It was binary. So, that's how I thought. Being a competitive athlete, I just accepted things as they were. If I couldn't change them with my willpower, then there's no point trying. Friday came. Harrison rolled outside the house in his Toyota Corolla, and Ellie ran after him, all ready to get drunk and possibly abducted. I have to say I was more worried about her going off with the guys than losing the key. But, deep down I had my evening planned too. In this fate, I realised that I would just sit back, relax, and watch a movie. Perhaps a couple of films, or something on the laptop. I had a subscription to Netflix, but it was not really anything on during this time if I remember right. I grabbed some dinner pretty early, at around 7pm. Ellie got picked up at 6.30, and she was due back at 3, like I said earlier on. The house was eerily quiet without Ellie. 
Nothing but the TV noise was really creepy, but I thought not much of it. All the doors were locked, all the windows were sealed, as it wasn't a particularly hot day out, and the evening the temperature dropped massively. If anything, I was considering putting the heating on, but for some reason the heating bills and utilities would skyrocket if we ever used them like that during the summer. Don't ask me why, that's a whole nother topic that I should probably bring up with my landlord. As the evening got darker, it ended up being around 10pm before I decided to call it a night. I decided to leave the porch light on for Ellie, as there was around maybe a one minute walk from the end of our drive to the house. It was quite long, I would say it was around 100 meters, maybe 150. We lived out in the rural areas, but it wasn't too far from town or near any of the clubs, so I guess you could call it semi-rural, semi-suburban. I went round and turned every light off, putting emphasis on leaving the porch light on and making sure everything was okay. At this point, I brushed my teeth and did my normal nighttime routine. I got into bed and made myself comfortable, still glitching mentally over how eerily quiet it was without her there. Ellie's the kind of girl that not only fears having no one around her, but she's also constantly stimulating. In other words, if she's not whistling, she's tapping. If she's not tapping, she's singing. If she's not singing, then she's laughing to TikToks. It's really a no-win. If you want peace and quiet, don't live with Ellie. But we are like yin and yang, total opposites. I'm a loner and I'm silent. So as you can imagine, we get on like a house on fire. Jokes. Wink wink. The night came upon me, and I found myself resting with my head on my pillow. I must have fallen asleep pretty fast, as I didn't remember anything between me really putting my head on the pillow, and then the next thing I realise I'm waking up. I never usually woke up in the night, not to pee, not to grab a drink, or any of those weirdos that eat midnight snacks. It wasn't my thing. I was quite a heavy sleeper, and it took a lot to wake me up. So, as you can imagine, I was genuinely confused as to why I was woken up. I'd been asleep for two hours, and it was around midnight now. So, I was looking around, trying to find a thing that had woken me up. When I say a thing, that might seem funny, but I don't know what it was. I couldn't hear any noises, Ellie hadn't come home three hours early, and I hadn't left the TV on. So what was it? I know sometimes people say hormonal changes can cause you to wake up, but it wasn't that time of the month either for me, so I was generally confused as to why I'd just woken up. I decided to get up, as my mind was playing games on me, I went to grab a drink from the kitchen sink, just a bit of tap water. I put my gown on, open my bedroom door and walk out. Sure enough, I can see that the porch light is still on. I go to the kitchen and get myself a glass of water. I sip it, and the ice cold water is welcomed by my rather dry throat. At this point, I only took a few sips, that's all it took. I poured the rest of the water away down the sink, and then put the glass on the draining board. I turned around and turned the kitchen light off, and walked. As I looked left, my peripheral vision could just make out that there was no longer a porch light on. At first, I barely even thought about it. It didn't really process. I took a few more steps and entered my room, and then eventually it clicked. Why is the porch light not on anymore? It was on half a minute before when I walked into the kitchen to get a drink. Okay, this is weird. I almost backtrack, walking backwards a few steps. I go out of the doorway and into the hall, and again, I see that the porch light is still off. At this point, I was getting scared and I didn't know what to do, so I ended up just standing there and staring. I could feel myself shaking, and I was genuinely terrified. My logical brain started to kick in, thinking that perhaps the light had just gone out. I can't remember the last time we left the porch light on all night, 
and I'm guessing the landlord was stupid and didn't replace the old bulbs. Perhaps it had blown. But then, the other side of my brain said, Really? Blown within the half a minute I walked between one point of the house to the other? While I was awake? It didn't add up, and I just felt so uneasy. I was still stood there at this point, staring at the porch. This was the front door leading out to the porch, where I should have been seeing an orange glow light, but I was seeing nothing but darkness. I walked closer towards the door, with absolutely zero intention of unlocking it and going out to check a bulb at midnight. As I get closer, the bulb starts to flicker, and sure enough, I sigh, and almost blame it on the landlord in my head, thinking he's an idiot that can't replace or fix anything. All of a sudden, the flickering gets stronger and stronger, until eventually, the bulb comes on completely and illuminates the whole front porch once again. My eyes could barely process what I witnessed next. The second that that porch light lit up the whole room, I imagined that I was seeing things. I had to rub my eyes as in front of me on the very other end of the front door was a figure. A figure of a dark shadowy man just stood there, barely moving. I could see his hands moving and his arms reaching towards the doorknob. All of a sudden, I hear him trying the door. It's locked. I let out a scream and begin to panic. I fell over almost in a panic, trying to run away from this random stranger at my door at midnight. I ran back to my room, unput my charger off my phone and dialed 911 faster than I could. At one point, I mistyped the number and dialed the completely wrong number. I had to try again, compose myself, all while I'd shut my bedroom door and propped up a chair up against the door handle. At this point, I remember the dispatcher answering, 911, what's your emergency? Where are you? I told them where I was, and that I had a strange man at my door at midnight. I believed he was trying to break in, and I needed help. I was squirming, my voice was rattly, and I was scared for my life. At this point, I noticed something else. The figure had now gone to my bedroom window. I screamed once more, except this time the figure started knocking on my window. Sarah? Sarah? What? <laughs> what? I panted, out of control, losing my breath. On the verge of losing consciousness, I was so lightheaded. Hello? Hello, ma'am, the dispatcher over the phone. There's no way this had just happened to me. I recognised the voice. It was Harrison. I walked to the front door, trying to compose myself. I hung up on 911 because I was so embarrassed. It turns out that Ellie had blacked out drunk, she was at the hospital, and Harrison had come to tell me. Why the fuck wouldn't he call me? This guy scared the hell out of me. After this, I went to see Ellie at the hospital. She had to stay in the night as she had her stomach pumped. She generally lost control and was a complete idiot that night. Also nearly caused me a heart attack because of indirect actions. Eventually when I got home that night, I went to bed at around 3am when she was supposed to come back. When I got back, there was a squad car pulled in my drive. I guess they were responding to the call and I shouldn't have irresponsibly hung up on them. I apologised and explained the situation in full, and eventually they just left. This is my Home Alone horror story. Call it a Home Alone humour story, but to me it was horror. <laughs>